morning or good evening again. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening if you're hearing us from Europe or good morning to all the people across the American continent. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, also welcome if you're listening to this at a later moment after you have downloaded the records. Uh, the title of the webinar today is Asset Intelligence, the right digital tools for the right jobs. Uh, so I have today with me uh, Etienne Leconte, uh, CEO of PowerHub and James Pagonis, Director at PowerHub. Um, yeah, a brief agenda for today. Uh, 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 first, uh, a short introduction on our webinar and panelists. Uh, shortly after, Etienne, uh, CEO of PowerHub, and James uh, Pagonis, Director at PowerHub, will explain what to look for when navigating the digital toolbox and also highlight on how to create a platform for growth through information and not only uh, through data. Uh, there will be still, of course, uh, some time for Q&A later. Uh, so please feel free to, yeah, during the webinar, uh, put your questions on the, on the chat box and we will end our webinar in approximately one hour. Again, my name is uh, Marcel Langone. I'm project manager at Solar Plaza within the Solar Asset Management uh, Conferences. Uh, these are my contact details, so feel free to get in touch with me if you have any question regarding the Solar Asset Management Conferences uh, or any of our conferences. Uh, for those of you that don't know us that well, we are a global platform for solar PV. Our main business is organizing high-level B2B conferences and trade missions. Um, yeah, over 100 in, uh, in the last 13 years and in more than 30, 30 countries. And we have a network of 60,000 plus uh, solar professionals and growing every day. This webinar is, is a pre-call, or should I say uh, last call, for the yearly conference Solar Asset Management North America. This will be already the fifth edition to be held in San Francisco uh, next week, 13 and 14 March. Um, we this is the leading conference that is focused on operational phase of solar plants and portfolios. Uh, we expect around 500 attendees uh, from the whole industry chain, um, around 100 speakers that will share their knowledge and expertise, and more than 40 sponsors and exhibitors at the show. And of course, I would like to leave a, a note of appreciation to all of our sponsors, including the, the speakers of today, for making our conferences and content uh, possible. In the screen, you can see uh, an overview of, of the, this year's attendees. For the full overview, you can uh, see uh, yeah, the, the website. Uh, so if you haven't registered uh, yet, uh, don't miss the chance to meet the professionals of all these companies at the conference. Some practical notes before we start. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please make use of, of the chat box. Also for the Q&A session, please make use of the same uh, chat box. Uh, we will address as many questions as possible after the, the presentations, of course, and still any, um, any question that is an answer, we, our speakers we will be happy to do so. Um, yeah, the presentation slides and video recordings will be available afterwards uh, our webinar. Presenting our first speaker of today, Etienne Lecom. He is CEO of uh, PowerHub. He's a recognized leader and entrepreneur in renewable energy, software development, and regul regulatory compliance. And he started PowerHub after founding the renewable energy compliance consultancy firm uh, called Local Content Assurance Bureau, or in short, LCAB. Um, with Etienne, uh, Etienne will be joined by James Pagonis, director at PowerHub. He's also a recognized leader and experienced solar energy expert, having worked 
working hundreds of uh, renewable energy projects uh, worldwide. He's one of the early drivers behind the development and launch of Power Hub and continues to be responsible for product development and uh, at Power Hub. Uh, so James, at the end, be, be ready. I'm going to share you the, the keyboard and we'll, we'll give you the stage. Hi, Juan. Thank you so much, Marcel, uh, for, for the, the kind introduction. Uh, I'll just give the screen a few seconds to load. I don't know if I'm able to do that already. Okay, we are on, on the presentation. Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Marcel. Thanks, everybody, for uh, being here uh on a tuesday morning tuesday afternoon or tuesday evening i guess if you're really motivated and are in europe uh so today uh james and i are going to have a look uh at what people use how and why really kind of the digital tool toolbox uh that's available for for solar energy professionals uh what that means what can uh, and what you should consider uh while you're kind of making that transition there's a lot of talk about digitalization of processes of information and so on so we'll, we'll obviously uh, breach those topics uh and i'm just trying to uh, oh okay perfect uh so i've already kind of covered this and uh so before we jump into kind of our our basically our topic our conversation and so on we'll try to make this a little bit more dynamic throughout the presentation so you'll have a variety of polls uh so feel free to jump in and say well, first and foremost, to say who you are, uh, and that's going to kind of guide a little bit of our discussion as we move forward. And we're going to ask a bunch of them uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, also, make this a bit more dynamic as well. As, you have know, James and I kind of uh, going back and forth together. So uh, we'll just let you guys uh, follow the poll, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, and the first poll of, of the day is how would you describe uh, yourself? Uh, as a project developer, as an operations uh, manager, as an asset manager, or as a technology provider. And yeah, you have the, the poll uh, right now on your screen. We will give just a few seconds to vote and we will be back on uh, analyzing the results. Just a few more seconds before we show the, the results. Okay, let's uh, let's see the the results. Okay, so we, we have kind of a even even mix uh, of people, except for these people kind of early on on the development phase, uh, which still is super important. Uh, projects you start at, at at the onset and basically actually digitizing that process uh, throughout uh, development, construction, and onwards to operations and asset management can be uh, uh, really helpful for everybody. And uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, technology providers. Uh, in the audience as well. So uh, uh, hello to our colleagues in, uh, in different companies and uh, probably some of our partners and integration people, uh, companies that we, uh, we connect with. Um, so uh, we'll just go back to the presentation uh, from our side. A little bit about uh, Power Hub. I think Max has given a great introduction about uh, me and James. Obviously great pictures there as well. Um, so uh, so for, for, for our company, we're based uh, in Toronto and Canada. Our team now, 45 people, uh, and I'm just trying to, okay, here we are, uh, here we are, uh, all in-house developers, and we've uh, built a power of the last uh, four to seven years, and really what we've, we've done over the years is really built a tool that's dedicated for flexibility. So we're a Canadian team, we're really nice people on top of it all, uh, but more importantly, we've really built a tool set to help you manage your assets your way. 
Uh, and that's a key, uh, a key point of view that we have is that systems should be really supporting the way you want to work and your goals uh, rather than force you down a path uh, that you need to work in. Uh, so it's all about your flexibility and your vision. And we're going to talk about it actually about your goals and how you want to go forward. Uh, about uh, me and James, uh, in passing, I think we've worked together on a billion gigawatts uh, of solar and as far as bragawatts are concerned. And that's just on, on, the, on the project for Sky Power alone. Uh, and then uh, beyond that, uh, just as Power Hub, we've done about 10, 10 real gigawatts, and that's important. We have about 3,000 projects now on the platform. So really exciting time for Power Hub. Uh, but fundamentally, we're both process, technology, and renewable professionals. Uh, so we're excited about chatting uh, with you today and uh, bringing uh, basically our observations to the forefront. And we're happy to discuss them uh, as well with you. I know Marcel has mentioned that you can ask questions. Uh, so please don't hesitate. It's going to make this uh, a lot more dynamic. Uh, and I'm actually going to follow up with another question uh, right away. Uh, so Marcel, if you want to uh, pull up the poll uh, already, um, we're, we're asking uh, people how many sources of data you're currently managing in your organization. Uh, is it one to two, two to four, four to six, or too many accounts? And those can be uh, DAS, SCADA, project management, document management. Uh, uh, your definition of a system uh, will we'll go. So uh, curious to see how many you're, you're using in your in your day-to-day. -day. Yeah, thanks, Etienne. We have the, the poll uploaded already. Uh, please uh, to all of you that are hearing us, um, start voting and we will comment on the results in a, in a few seconds. Okay, just a few more seconds. We have some. Okay, let's see the results already. At the answer, Hi, surprising or not? <laughs> uh, James here. I, this is not surprising, um, and and it's typical what we see um, in the industry. Um, and it, and I'm actually excited to see a lot more in the two to four range. Uh, typically, we get, we see a lot of people uh, that are talking about too many systems, they have six and more, um, and looking to aggregate. It, it's really interesting because as we move forward, um, what we're finding is a lot of people are trying to move into that two to, two to four range and, and then uh, bring those systems together, centralize them, and then aggregate them uh, with a system similar to ours that, that aggregates data across multiple platforms so they can have um, different locations to log in. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see those results because they, they continue to reinforce uh, a lot of the reasons. And and as as you notice from all of that, I mean, the real problem is is that your digital toolbox looks more like an alphabet soup right now. We have ERPs, CMMSs, IRPs, DAS, and if you look at these, most of these have been developed from other industries and are being used in renewables. They all have these core competencies. They all generally have to be adapted to bring into our industry as, as renewables. I mean, I just heard a story the other day where essentially one of the key fields that a renewable energy company was using just didn't have enough characters. And just getting that updated sometimes is a bit of a challenge. So um, it's really interesting to see these. And, and when we take all these systems, you know, they can not only have these core competencies, but they also can be very expensive to implement and people are trying to reduce those costs. So this is all pretty common about what we're finding. Now, when we look at these two, the other problem is they generally don't scale well for renewables. A lot of these are older systems from other systems and they're designed from an ideology of an organization down. And so what happens is your organization imposes a structure on the projects that are underneath, which is an interesting problem for the renewables because from the renewables perspective, a lot of the projects are special snowflakes. So what happens is, is you need something that's more of a ground up, something that can help 
renormalize the information and structure it into useful information for the organization and your portfolios. And this is where a lot of the old systems don't scale well is because they have to keep being adjusted and adapted. And it's especially problematic for renewables where you get a lot of regional variability. You also get a lot of rules and regs that change. So having this constant adaptive, adaptive nature of them makes the old systems tough. You know, and, no. and reconfiguring some of these may just not be possible. Right, because of when they were designed and what they were designed for them. And it can be incredibly expensive and time consuming to try and cram a square peg into a round hole. The other thing yeah. you need to ask about these old systems is sorry, Chen? No, no, James, sorry. I just want to kind of jump in and say that those are kind of very, very valid points. Uh, and that people tended to kind of grasp onto kind of older systems that that they have just for the because they were there uh we, i often hear this in discussions uh, with clients like oh why are you using this approach this method tool like oh it was there before that's what we're using uh so often enough uh, it's useful as well to kind of question the systems that you have in place uh so they don't become a liability of course of course and 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 that's fine. I mean, think about these things. We have been a fast-growing industry. So so where we were ten years ago, what was available to us as a tool set, is completely different now, right? And that's an important point you bring up is is about the liability of these systems, and and that really is something you need to look at. Is does the systems you got in place centralize the information in a person? Because this can be a real challenge. You know, does it require extensive training in IT to run properly and have a single administrator? You know, um, a perfect example of this is the spreadsheet tracker that's everywhere along the thing. Well, it's typically managed by a single person and all the formulas and stuff that go into it are known by that one person. Well, what happens when they win the lottery? How do you transition that knowledge? How do you de decentralize it? Or other challenges that happen is you end up in information silos. And it, this tends to lead to more problems. So it's really a connectivity issue that, that, that you can face. I, exactly, exactly. And, and the biggest challenge is, is disconnected data causes more problems. I mean, it's these silos can create some problems where you're making business decisions without all the information available. Even though it is available, you're just not aware of it in the silos. And what it boils down to is you can spend more time searching for more information, compiling information, triaging information, making sure it's even the most up-to-date information. And what it effectively does, it turns a lot of asset managers into almost librarians or search engines, where they spend a lot more time trying to dig up information and send that data to various different groups. No, that, made, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. Uh, I, I can't, uh, I, I, we haven't created that full question, but I'd be curious to see, for, especially for the asset managers that are on the call today, how much time they lose uh, just answering these uh, random requests every day. What's the capacity of site A? Uh, when does the PPA start or the COD date? Uh, they're all kind of contextual information that are so important uh to kind of for different parties in the organization because ultimately you want to learn from your previous projects uh and that that really kind of create creates a challenge and i think one of the big challenges is like a lot of data is not always digital or if it's digital it's not uh in a useful enough format that that people can relate to it uh which brings us i think to our our next question which is uh pretty interesting from our perspective is uh, what percentage of your current business processes are currently digital? So they're run in a systematic way in a system. Uh, Excel doesn't count as a system. Uh, sorry uh, for all, all kind of the, the businesses running on, on Excel here. Uh, but if you look at the overall percentage of your business, uh, the poll is now open, uh, what percentage would be digital? Let's give it a few seconds to, to vote, and we will shortly comment on the results.
that's that's interesting uh, results, James. Is that what you're expecting? Um, I'm actually amazed at how many are are, are hiding towards the uh, the 75 to 100 percent. Um, but I mean, the the sheer number in the 25 and the zero to 50 percent it really speaks to what we've seen um, and and what we're finding in the industry. I mean, it, it's not uncommon that people have um, processes that are established in you know one digital tool like their accounting system. I mean, it's it's more unlikely that they have digital processes that cross these different systems. And that's where we're really seeing a lot of value in these and people looking for a lot of value is, is bringing a lot of these pieces together uh, and sharing information and building these processes across their entire group. It's, it's a very important um, piece to the whole structure. So if I can oh, just get I, to the I, next slide here. Yeah, that's what I was gonna <laughs> go for there. So yeah, what we, we definitely see is that a lot of people coming to us and, and looking to get Okay, do you want to mute yourself, please? Can you hear me, Seal? Yes. Okay, perfect. I yeah, the the my sound got lost for a little second. Um, are we ready to show a another poll? No, no, no. We're we're just talking. There's a lot of background noise from your side. Okay, can you hear us well right now? Yeah, we're good. Thank okay, you. let's continue. Okay, so as I was saying, a lot of people are coming to us um, and and asking, saying, hey, we want to get more digital. And it's a great idea and a great opportunity. And this is a great place for people to try and bring context to their information. It's important. They want to have this data that connects and brings different information from different systems and brings all that information today together so they can make meaningful business decisions. So. What are they trying to bring together? Well, they're looking at things like evaluating whether she roll a truck on a, on a site. So how are the different pieces of information coming in? Well, you don't just look at, oh, well, I'm down and I'm not generating a megawatt a day. The question becomes, is that meaningful? Is it reasonable? Do you roll a truck based on that information? Well, think about it in context. Now, so you, you take that information and now you add information about from the revenue side. Hey, well, that is generating 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So what am I losing a day? Eh, it's really not that much, right? Oh, well then how long can I sit? Do I roll a truck if that truck costs $1,500, $2,000? Well, let's look at the next thing. When is the next person coming in? And that comes from a different source, usually a CMMS. So as you can see, when everybody wants to get digital, they want to bring all this information into one place. So it's a really noble goal for everybody to get digital. The challenge, though, that we find as an industry is that everybody wants to run before they walk. And it's typical that we hear, you know what, I want to bring digital in so that I can put some AI and some automated processes in my system. And this is really great, but the biggest first step, especially in our industry, is to get all those information online and then look at them and start building processes around them so that they can start running and we can start giving the AI tools something to learn. So I think it's really important that a lot of people are engaged with getting digital, but focus on the key things you need to do to get started and try not to run before you walk. So where should people start, James? What's kind of the first logical step uh, that someone or a company should take when they're, they're looking about making the move to kind of a, a broader digitalization or uh, bringing tools in to help them out? I think that's really important. The key to starting this is identifying your goals. Keep a broad goal, but keep it specific to a business process. For example, like we hear a lot of, we want to bring our organization into the 21st century, or we want to utilize digital tools for better business decision making. Both are awesome goals. They're noble, they're, they're, they're great, but they aren't specific to a business process. They're, they're tough to target and they're tough to look at a tool you can use to help doing that. So the key is to sort of focus this onto a business process. You know, for example, we want to look at the pain point 
that are really affecting your organization and start tackling business goals around them. Like, hey, we want to share information easier among teams, or we want to automate some of our reporting process, or we really want to decentralize information and control of that information, you know, or we want to integrate all our systems together. All these are much more key goals that you can start going out and looking for systems, looking for pieces of software that can help you achieve these goals. I mean, one well, of the key things we hear all the time is around reporting. We want to make our reporting more efficient. Uh, that, 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 that's a great one because especially reporting, uh, it's so widely uh, important uh, for everybody, for financial reporting, for uh, operational reporting, our tax reporting, and so on. But a question I'd like to ask the audience is really how much time you guys spend on reporting uh as as companies is it more a matter of uh days minutes weeks uh or is that something that's kind of a constant process uh where you have one of your your analysts uh just pulling constant reports for you so i said if you could uh just pull up the poll uh we'll we'll, we'll see how, how people kind of uh jump into that and uh in the interim it, it's it's such a it, reporting is always a challenge for, for everyone and it's really about okay well i'm just generating these canned reports but it doesn't integrate the different parts of my organization that i need and that that speaks to what james was saying earlier about uh the connections and the context uh, that is so important uh to um to really review kind of information and make meaningful decisions uh, and then not necessarily copying and pasting from report one and report two to create report three. Uh, but really curious to see uh, how, how much time people are using. Yeah, the results are just uh, visible to everyone. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Marcel. Uh, I, I'm not really surprised to see that, that date. Uh, I'm actually surprised to see um, less of the week um because we we see a lot of people that are that are spending a lot of time especially in large, larger portfolios um that that just the process of reporting on some of these larger portfolios involves a lot of time to bring the information together um and getting it in well oh, it, it's easy to do math right a week is if you 40 times an hour uh it goes pretty quickly uh so for sure that that's the thing that that, that you want so uh, let's say reporting is a goal that, that you have kind of streamlined or you have other uh, loftier goals for, for your organization, for your digitization strategy. Uh, what's next? What, what should people kind of really look towards? I, I like to call it the introspective step. Um, and that's about knowing what you have. And, and it's not just, you know, going looking for, hey, what data do we have and what do we integrate? Great. It's really trying to identify the infrastructure and the pieces you already have in place. And then the second step is go get that information. A lot of cases, people want to try and bring a lot of their infrastructure and their business processes in and centralize it and, and use tools to help build those processes, but they don't actually have control of some of that information. So one of the key things is to find what you have and go get what you don't have, right? And the other thing is also to evaluate more than just the data, but evaluate your internal resources you have available because the process is involving people, you know, and you need people both to get the information, to provide context, to get it in, to learn how to do this, but also to champion, also to, to drive this forward. And, and those are some key pieces that people need to get in place and understand in order to start this process. And often I suggest they do that before they even go out and truly go searching for software. No, and that goes back also to what you were mentioning about legacy systems early on. And it's also a good part of evaluating if you're using systems uh, that, that can not necessarily fit uh, or that you're forcing to fit uh, to, to your business. Uh, so you've created goals, you kind of establish what data you have access to, what systems you currently have in place. Uh, what's next? Um, set a practical timeline. Um, and, and that slide says it all. I mean, the process is involved. I mean, depending on your size, depending on how your history, this can be a short, you know, 
month time frame to bring it into the system, or it could be a year. And, and to really set these practical timelines, also breaking your goals up into meaningful chunks helps facilitate this. It not only brings up morale and allows people to see quick victories, but it makes it meaningful and something to show and you can show a return on investment, especially to the higher ups that need to show, hey, we're digitizing processes. Where are we at? Where's it really coming in? And it really helps the whole process. The other thing and I want to say with, sorry, go I'm on. Going, I, so I was going to say, it's also a resource thing, right? Timeline equals the resources you, you provide as well. Uh, the more internal resources you're committing uh, to a process, uh, to a project, or the more resources a vendor can provide you as well. That, that's also kind of one thing that, that we see as being very helpful to our clients is uh, just providing people to, to migrate data, to provide data entry services, those other things. They're less glamorous tasks, but it can rad radically decrease that that timeline uh, and make the team uh, more productive uh, ultimately. For sure. And and the other key is to understand some of your business limitations. Like when you go towards the year end, if you're trying to do an implementation that ends around your year end, you're just going to run into roadblocks. Start thinking about the key business things that occur so that you can really practically set these timelines so they happen at the right time. As, as we all know, you go to year end, you know, all chaos breaks loose and then there's a break usually around the holidays and then people tend to come back in and regroup and go. So setting a timeline that tries to end in around December is usually not a practical one, but setting one that ends in February is really good because you have a good timing where people are re-energized and re-engaged with everything they want to accomplish. And is there uh, other aspects that people should consider uh, when looking at their digital tools? For sure, for sure. And, and that is, don't try to get everything in one place. I love this slide. You know, your dry cleaner does not do your taxes. It's, it's one of those things. Our world has evolved with businesses that establish core competencies. And that's what you want from your software as well. You want a software that's got some real key core competencies that they can keep building on and giving you a lot of that value. The generalists tend to be challenging. Either that are really expensive and really long to implement and get rigid over time. So try and focus on these core companies and bring these things in together. So you, you may have this huge body of different goals and things, but understand that, that, that maybe what you need is three different pieces of software and something like our tool, which is an aggregator of these that brings the information together. I mean, I like to think of this as a mall. Like where you go to the mall and you come in and there is your dry cleaner, your tax provider and your grocery store and your liquor store more so than a single piece of software that tries to be a liquor store, a grocery store and a dry cleaner and all that. This is how you really gain value. And this is how you really build that together. And at the same time, it's, it's about not necessarily changing everything about your organization, uh, but really about the way uh, you go about certain pieces of the work. Do you want, you want to share a few stories about that, Jeff? Of course. I mean, at the, at the onset, you, your business really doesn't change. Your, your core business is what you're trying to support. But the interesting thing, and this is a really important time, is when you go to digitize your tools, be open to change. The route can change to get there. This is a time when you can reevaluate some of your business processes, not just get value out of the digitization, but also value about looking at some of the ways in which you're doing things and finding better routes. And software often gives you those. And I remember stories about, um, a perfect example is this, I had someone who wanted me to help build this list for him in the software. And so I looked at the list and I looked at him and I said, why are you making me build that list? And he's like, well, what I do is I take my Word document and I split screen it here and I take that list and I put it here and then and I simply cut and paste it onto this page. And I'm like, why don't you just let me skip this and just build you your report for you to review? And that's kind of some of the things that are the route can change and you can let software help you build that route. And I think that's a very good point uh, because software tools evolve constantly. Uh, so letting the software surprise you uh, and learning about the capabilities and talking uh, with your vendors and talking about what they have on the roadmap, what they're building towards, 
uh, is often a kind of eye opening as well. Uh, so kind of looking at uh, what they're working on, uh, who's working on it, uh, what's the best practice, what's a new approach, how can we shave time? It's really about pushing uh, the vendors uh, themselves to, have, to empower you. Um, as a software vendor, we obviously seen a lot of different uh, types of projects, types of operations uh, across a variety of geographies. I think uh, we're, we're working in 21 different countries. Uh, so you see very different PPAs, very different processes, but at the same time, flexibility in how you address and how you run your business, uh, I think really becomes super important uh, to what you learn, how you implement software. Uh, as, as James mentioned, right, it's having goals and, and, and pushing those forward and basically asking the question, what's possible sometimes? Uh, and not taking uh, uh, the copy-paste approach and that's but really focusing on the, hey, what's the destination? Where am I heading? And that becomes very helpful. So given everything we've said, I think I'd like to bring up the next poll here. Um, okay. And that's that's who's looking to digitize um, their processes, you know, in the new future. And, and there's a couple options there. I'd love to hear um, where everybody is and, and regardless of whether we set it now and it's changed your mind, let's see where your mind's at right now about looking to digitize the process. And that could be one or, or, or more. Uh, often enough, it's, it can be a simple thing. Okay, well, uh, digitizing your invoicing process as an example. Uh, <laughs> favorite uh, uh, use case for, for a lot of our clients. Let's, let's show the results. And yeah, it seems that uh, half, uh, half of the people are quite optimistic on uh, when to start uh, digitalizing processes. Is that, um, yeah, is, is that really surprising, this, uh, this urgency or? Well, the, the, that's a good question, Marcel, because this urgency uh, oftentimes happens in, in one of two ways. is a mistake that's been done in the past uh, that's going to push uh, uh, companies to change and digitize certain aspects so that the error doesn't happen again. Uh, but it's also growth. Uh, so if you're just about to kind of, uh, we're, we're, we're a few months away from summer, big build season uh, is going to be upon us. Uh, if you're, you're you're planning on doubling your portfolio or growing significantly, that's also a good time to uh, to invest uh, in time. And, and speaking of time, actually, it, it, that's a funny discussion that we have often enough uh, with uh, clients and prospective clients is when is the right time to implement a solution? Uh, and, and and often it's like, oh, I wish we'd had the time to do this. I wish we could do that then but we're building this next project, but financial year end is coming, oh, we're closing a, a new financing round and so on and so forth. And these are, these are important considerations that everyone needs to have, uh, but also there's a cost to not move. Uh, inertia has a cost itself. Uh, and that's where it's kind of allocating the right resources. Uh, to begin, there's a business case uh, for, for digitalization. There's, there's a business case for tools that empower your team. Uh, but there's, it's two sides of the coin. I say, what happens if we invest in software and it doesn't work 100%? Sure, that, that's kind of an issue, but that's where your vendors are gonna work with you to make it work for your processes and work through those issues and so on. But the, the flip side of that is what happens if you don't do anything and you don't change your process, you don't update, uh, and you're basically left behind somewhat. Uh, and, Projects are not uh, getting built uh, in less competitive situations. It's just becoming a more and more competitive market. Margins are getting smaller and smaller. There's more people out for the same plots of land uh, and so on. So it's just a, a, a kind of a race uh, there. So this is a place where you can actually have a competitive advantage and actually have lower headcount to manage a growing portfolio of assets. Uh, and we've seen this and done some ROI calculations with, with some of our clients. That's it's pretty impressive what you can get out. Uh, you, there's a real payback, but you have to commit the time and the resources to do it. Uh, and, and that's where um, playing together uh, and working with your vendors becomes so important uh, to make implementations a success. Um, and really, when you kind of look at it, uh, it it's pretty straightforward. Uh, 
look at your goals, plan for them. Uh, make sure that look at your processes, your team, and your and your tools. Uh, so a strong foundation for a business, in, in my opinion, is people, process, and technology. Uh, they are they need to kind of work hand in hand, and that's really where you're going to have the key success uh, from a, a successful implementation. Uh, basically, uh, teams can drive incredible things alone. Uh, if you don't have repeatable processes, you're going to have team members running uh, different parts of your business in different ways. Uh, and similarly, it's going to make a software implementation uh, uh, more challenging. So software implementations are a good time to kind of look also at the processes, what are the best way, but also to keep some flexibility. Uh, it's not uh, the years of kind of the big SAP implementation uh, where it takes two years and the process is basically set in stone thereafter it, it is gone. Uh, you can try, you can evolve with your software implementation and see what the process works for you and what works for your team. And that's super important uh, because we believe that once you do a successful implementation, you digitize your information, you have more contacts, you have more tools in your hands and the, in the hands of your teammates, uh, you're just better positioned for the future. Uh, it really creates a strong foundation for growth. And if we look all across the world, renewables are growing like mad. Uh, so that's why we, we say that it's the right time uh, to invest in digitization uh, because that's really going to help uh, propel your business forward. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, this, this afternoon slash morning slash evening, depending on where you are, especially if you're listening to this after the fact. Uh, but uh, that said, we'd love to open it up uh, to questions for uh, with James uh, and myself. Uh, we, hopefully, we have uh, some good questions, and hopefully, you'll, you'll like the answers or not. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Etienne and James, for for your insights. Indeed, we still have a few time for our for questions Q and A's. So please, if you still haven't, yeah, if you still have any question and you have haven't still uh, yeah make make arrive those question to us um, yeah feel free to still pose uh, any question for us um, yeah so uh, Etienne and James you you mentioned just just before that you are yeah you're present uh, globally uh, uh -huh. from Latin America to to Japan um yeah what what kind of different uh, levels of digitalization do you, you see which differences do you see between uh, yeah between different regions and and markets that's a very good question as you know we were just in japan that was just in japan just last week uh so i think incredible market over there a large installed base uh, and so on and people are not now looking after a few years and almost 50 gigawatts installed, what are the right tools that we can implement to make sure that we have high service levels and so on? I've heard some horror stories of clients not even having monitoring systems, uh, which is uh, kind of shocking when you, you think about certain markets. Uh, and the corollary to that is now they're they're looking to invest and, and move forward, but uh, as we as we know, it's um, Japan can be a challenging market uh, to kind of approach and so on. That's where kind of software that's available in Japanese and the local team is going to be able to, to support it becomes so important. Uh, and that's what, what we're working uh, directly towards. And the correlate of that is, I'm going to say Chile, once again, huge installed base, lots of growth uh, happening there as well. And they're really looking to leapfrog, uh, I'm going to say, the age of Excel and go straight to more systematic approaches. So lots of interest uh, in that market, especially uh, to bring kind of next generation tools uh, in front of us or in front of them to skip uh, skip a step. And uh, we know how complicated just invoicing for power is in Chile. Uh, it's no real surprise that you're trying to move away from uh, manual processes as much as you can. Yeah, and, and and to add to that, I think the interesting thing is we find that the market really drives um, the uptake of digitization. So in markets where there's been a lot more 
competitiveness around the PPA and the structuring of projects. They've really looked for digital tools to try and offset some of the costs they've had to defer um, to bring things in, reduced operating costs and things like that. So I, I think there's a few different factors in here um, that are really interesting in what drives this. Yeah, very, very interesting discussion in, indeed. Uh, this, uh, these different PPAs and different business models will, will of course, uh, yeah, shape uh, the, the level of digitalization. And especially, for example, talking, talking about Japan, where it's such a, such a big market still, but it seems like there is, yeah, still lack of, uh, of maturation in, in some aspects, of course. Uh, what, what do you think are the, are the main um the main limitations for of asset owners to to adopt these these solutions why yeah why is isn't this uh being uh applied since since a few a few years i i think i'd i'd say committing time we've talked to a ton of asset owners and asset managers who really want to get to it um and, and i think that really speaks to one of our slides is that there's a lot of people that want to do it and it's just like oh well we're too busy to run the rfp we're too busy to really engage um, we see a lot of that um and i'm really hoping to see that more people take us out of word that there's never going to be a right time i mean business keeps getting faster more quickly and if you want to do much more with the small teams that you have and continue to tackle these opportunities. You gotta get some of this, you know, mindless tasks and things you can automate out of the way. And there's a huge value for it. Um, yeah, and what, what are, looking now, looking now at the, at the coming years at the future, what do you see, what do you anticipate that are, will be the, the key trends or innovations in, um, on digitalization and the asset management software? I think what we'll see is a lot more interconnectivity. I think we still see a lot of uh, organization running in silos and things like that. So broader context uh, to make decisions is going to really enhance that. So that's going to be uh, on the tool side, uh, just providing something that's really dedicated to each user level. Uh, so if I'm an asset manager, when I when I log in, I see uh, certain key information there. If I'm an operations manager, I'll see something else, and so on. So really, context and user-driven uh, information are really going to help uh, make people more productive. Obviously, a lot more automation uh, is coming through, uh, automated validation of data, and so on. So QA, QC processes as well, uh, really being uh, pushed forward uh, by software. Uh, and then this, this uh, I'm going to say, this, this dream we have of kind of the one-stop shop or this, this marketplace where I think James was referring earlier to kind of have the mall where you can have access to everything. Uh, I think we'll really see an evolution of a, even of a marketplace uh, for software, for tools, for data sets, uh, and so on, that you can all pull in together uh, to your own business and, and run it how you want. Uh, so if you want uh, an external data feed for uh, satellite irradiance, and you're, you want to schedule a, a flyover of your plants uh, to, uh, to do an IR scan, uh, and you want to kind of renew your O&M uh, contracts and so on. So we're going to see a much broader interconnectivity between services, software, and uh, external data sources. Uh, so I think that convergence of that uh, is where we want to be. Uh, we find that excessively uh, exciting. Very good, uh, James. Any any comment on on this? You know, I coming from the product side, I I find it interesting because I I get a lot of visions and ideas from a ton of people, and it's really interesting to see over time how um, how it seems to coalesce in an overall vision. Um, in, into a product and, and you see the market start loading in. I mean, a perfect example is, is things like dashboards, how even a few years ago, the adjustable and the changing nature of dashboards wasn't as important to people. Um, and, and now it's almost critical that everybody has an ability to bring what they need up to the front 
and bring that out. And that's what I that's why I want to agree with the Tian on this marketplace thing is is I'm starting to hear on the periphery of people like you know, it'd be great is if I could just log in and be able to buy the things I need to buy. Um, so we're seeing a lot of those um, type of things. So I really want to agree with that. And, and, and the other interesting thing is I see some interesting parts around the um, automated intelligence of bringing some of that in, not to sort of affect people's processes, but to give them insight into things they may want to build processes around. Um, interesting. We we have seen uh, on the last last poll I believe that that we put on onto the to the other audience and also round, rounding off our our webinar um, th there is a, a very good part of our of our participants uh, uh, quite an urgency of of going digital what, what would be your, your your last message for for the participants call me. <laughs> <laughs> We're at Solar Asset Management uh, next week in San Francisco. Uh, we'll, we'll love to have kind of a chat and what that means for you and so on. And uh, happy to have kind of that chat. Uh, but, but more importantly, as we kind of said, it's about having a plan, clear goals, uh, knowing your resources, having timeline, uh, and giving yourself the right resources that's going to make this a success. Yeah, and I'd like to add to one thing that I think for people looking to digitize, um, and we didn't touch about it in the presentation, but we probably should have, is is look for somebody who's willing to be there as a relationship with you. I mean, SaaS these days is about a relationship with your vendor more than it is in buying a commodity. And so it's that relationship that's really going to help bring you success and help you give places where you can provide feedback and, and learn about new processes and things like that. So one of those key things I'd probably bring up to. Etienne, James, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your presentation, for the discussion uh, and for the great insights. Um, yeah, we will of course continue the, um, the discussion in one week in Solar Asset Management North America in San Francisco. Uh, thank you to all our attendees for inputs and the participation. And I hope the webinar was of value to you just uh, would like to remember again that the recordings will be available afterwards. If you have still any question or remarks, my contact details are on the screen right now. Uh, on behalf of the team, uh, we hope to meet you at our conference in, in San, Fran Fran San Francisco uh, to next Tuesday and Wednesday or at any other of our upcoming solar asset management conferences. The next one in uh, Tokyo, Japan, uh, next 24 and 25 uh, May. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, have a great day or great evening if uh, you're in Europe. Thank you so much, Marcel, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.